We begin today with some excellent title placement. How can you beat that? They're in New Jersey, 1938. That's Joe Lewis, heavyweight champ. Maybe the best there ever was. Hey, I thought you said you were at the bottom of the class. And light heavyweight champ on my boxing team. This is my kind of history, kid. You never told me. Even I can be modest. Guess I never noticed. <laughs> Next time. Not if you keep telegraphing it like that. Sorry, when you telegraph a blow, you're basically making it obvious what you're going to do. The way Bog tensed up and started to turn his body there told Jeffrey what was coming and he avoided it. If Bog was champion back in school, either he was a lot better then or Voyagers suck at boxing. Come on. Come on. He doesn't look very champion-y right now. Come on. Why isn't he fighting back? I think he's trying. Quick rundown. Two years before, Joe Lewis fought Max Schmeling, Nazi Germany's champion, and lost. Schmeling wants a rematch, and his government is touting it as the ultimate way to prove that the Aryan race is superior to the Negro savage. Lewis isn't just fighting for himself. He's fighting for his entire race, and his trainer keeps reminding him of it. So I, for one, am not surprised that Joe Lewis is losing his nerve. But it's more than just Jack's nagging. It goes back to an interview he gave a couple of weeks prior. That reporter, he was shot. He knew. He let me know. If I lose that fight, everybody in the whole country is going to believe the black man isn't good enough. My whole people. Your people, Jack. How's it like that low late on you, man? And you haven't let him forget it for a moment. You were throwing it in his face not five minutes ago in the ring. If I duck it, he can call me chicken. Not you, not Billy, not Seth, just me. It's hard to fault his logic, but speaking as someone who grew up on the other side of the equation, it wouldn't matter. They'd consider your people inferior whether you fight Schmeling or not. All you'll do is take one small propaganda victory away from them and it won't amount to a thing. There's only one thing you'll accomplish if you do this. You'll have a hard time looking at yourself in the mirror. Next thing we know, Jeffrey has talked Joe's friend into having Bog, or should I say, Herr Bog, former sparring partner for Schmeling, be Joe's sparring, I mean, sparring partner. The idea is to let Joe pound on him a bit. They're going to build his confidence back up. Damn it, damn it. Oh, Joe, oh, damn. Joe, you hurt. What is this? Joe, are you all right, Joe? That's not how you build his confidence back up. In fact, he's more convinced than ever the fight of the century is off. He doesn't care what the commission or anybody else does to him. He's not doing this. His regular sparring partner, Billy, wants to take Bog into the ring for real, but Jeffrey won't allow it. He omnis them out of there. Well, how about some coffee? Hey, look. Right in midair. We never did this before. It's 1970. They're somewhere over Nevada, and the Omni has a red light. First things first. Uh, may I help you, sir? Renault, thanks. <sighs> Guess you're wondering why I got these on, huh? I wear them when I fly. They help my body adjust to the changing air pressure. It's the latest thing. Where Please, are you I'm... sitting, sir? Sitting? What do you mean? In the back. Right, uh, way back. May I see your tickets, please? Uh, you got the tickets? I thought you had the tickets. Oh, <laughs> thought he had the tickets. Wait here, please. She reports to the pilot that they have a couple of stowaways on board. Good afternoon, folks. I'm co-pilot Dorfman. Am I correct in assuming that you do not have tickets for this flight? Well, yeah. Except As that a we matter of airline policy, I can give you the opportunity to purchase tickets at this time. And if they don't have any money, what are you going to do? Kick them off the plane mid-flight? No ticket. More Excuse me. Would you kindly wait until I'm through? This one way, Flyboy. You want to guess what's in the case? Mike? Stay right where you are, lady. Do you hear me? All of you. Just stay right where you are. I guess we won't find out. His bomb takes priority. He goes to the cockpit, uses the radio, and makes some demands, primary of which is a suitcase with a million dollars in it. 
The pilot reports that they've rerouted the Salt Lake City, they're on autopilot, and... We're being removed from the cockpit. Clear the air corridor all the way in. Roger. We have radar contact. All traffic being advised. When will you call Salt Lake? Over. Don't call us. We'll call you. He escorts them out and says, nobody try any funny stuff. Now, I'm going back into the flight deck. Just so no one gets any funny ideas. Just in case, maybe I ought to bring you along just to keep me company. Fog? Wait, no. Bog offers to go in Jeffrey's place, and so does the lady who was sitting there. No, he wants Jeffrey. He doesn't know what he's getting himself into. Jeffrey is the true heir of the Will Robinson magic. By the time he's done, this guy will be the first ever skyjacker turned greed counselor. Well, what are you doing now? What are you taking, a professional interest? I'm just curious. Before this case gets to be too popular, we'll just add a little surprise in case I misplace it. In case you misplace the case. I see what you did there. Well, what's in those canisters? Get in an uproar. It's not deadly. It's just a knockout gas. Open the case. The gas is released. Everybody goes nighty-night. Jeffrey says, yeah, including you. You know, the flight crew, they've got their own eyes. Now, if I had to, I could get in here with one flight. Boy, that's all I'd need. What about the... Oh, the magic masks. I already unplugged them so they're not working. Setup complete. How is it going to go crosswise? U.S. Columbia 14, you are 200 miles out and need course correction for approach. Over. All right, that means that you want a pilot, right? Affirmative, U.S. Columbia. We have new coordinates for... All right, just hang on. With a couple more months of preparation, he could have learned how those controls work so he could do it himself. But now he has to put himself at the mercy of a pilot. Captain, let's go. No matter what he does, keep all the passengers calm. Jeffrey runs into the flight deck, closes the door, and grabs one of the masks. We watch the gas spread through the ventilation system, and soon everybody on the plane is unconscious, including Bog, the hijacker, and both pilots. Jeffrey is it. He has to land the plane. Hey, Jonesy. Still awake up there? Yeah. Who's this? Why, wow, this here's the best dang pilot that money can buy. You and me going to have a whale of a time while you solo this baby. Solo? You're going to bring it right on home. Anybody recognize Three Finger Jack from The Mask of Zorro? Good to see his fingers grew back. He walks Jeffrey through the process of landing the plane, including course correction, adjusting airspeed, and lowering the landing gear. You can reach the brakes now, can't you? You mean I have to stop the plane? Piece of cake, Jeffrey, a piece of cake. Now on the floor, by your feet, two pedals, just like in a car. Yeah. You get those old toes ready, because just as soon as that bird kisses the ground, you're going to push on those at the same time. But you'll explain to him how to reverse the engines, too, right? Now, push. Reverse the engines. He's not only fighting the plane's momentum, they're still pushing it forwards. Harder, Jeffrey. Harder. Trying, trying. Stand on him, boy. Even in 1970, jet engines were built so they can move part of their shell. It comes out and back like this and forms a barrier that forces the thrust the other way. They have to do this because no friction brakes in the world are going to stop a plane that big on their own we get the obligatory long drawn out sequence where the plane doesn't slow down. Jeffrey has to stand on the pedals. The plane stops just short of the runway. Everybody's fine. That concludes this week's episode of Cliche Theater. Back to Joe Lewis. He's watching film of his fight with Schmeling. Okay, you've seen the show. 
they start trying to talk to him. He says, there's too much to lose. I don't dare take a chance of losing to the so-called master race, because if I do, everybody who doesn't look like them is screwed. Basically, he feels like the fate of the entire non-Aryan world is on his shoulders, and he can't carry it. But Jesse Owens didn't think like that. Two years ago at the Olympics, he stuck it right in Hitler's eye. Now you've got the chance to stick in his other eye. Bog says, win or lose, you're proving that a black man, the son of a poor sharecropper from Alabama, isn't afraid of anybody or anything and will strive to be the best he can possibly be. Joe needs time to think. And what do you think he'll decide? He went home, put on a wig, and became a waitress. He's going to fight Schmeling thanks to Jeffrey and Bog reminding him why he got into this to begin with. It's a very kind of Jerry Maguire, Rod Tidwell moment, with that particular Jeffrey Jones spin on it. You're flabby, champ. I know I'm out of shape, but I gotta try. Try, heck. You soft, man. <laughs> There's still time, Joe. Haven't any of you guys heard of Rocky Balboa? Since it's 1938 and Rocky came out in 1976, probably not. But Jeffrey knows Rocky's training regimen, so let's get to the montage. thought I'd end it with a little eye candy for those who appreciate that sort of thing. When you're in as good a shape as he was to begin with, and you've only let yourself go for a short time, it doesn't take much to get you back to where you're ready for action. When Jeffrey mentioned Rocky Balboa, I thought about playing a little of Gonna Fly Now over that, but since there is no Rocky and the song hasn't been written yet, those guys wouldn't get the joke. <laughs> Kid, if Joe eats that side of beef, you'll be able to beat him. Except it's not for eating. There are much easier ways to tenderize the meat before you grill it, gentlemen. The rematch! And now it is Lewis. How many keep down for 15 rounds? You may remember it was Kenny who won the first fight. But it is Lewis. Lewis, there's a guy in the link. And behind the link, he's running into the top. I wonder what those guys are saying. Good question. I'm guessing it isn't. Look at that tremendous Negro pound our wussy little Aryan. He's not quite sure where he is. It is Lewis moving in for the kill. Lewis with the right to left. Lewis with another left hand. Lewis with the right hand. And Schmeling goes down. One gets that right to squat. Max Schmeling is the bottom. And she's out. He's saying even less now. When you know you're in trouble, suppress evidence. Schmeling himself wasn't a member of the Nazi party and didn't appreciate the claims of racial superiority. In fact, he didn't like being used as a political tool at all. He said, I'm a fighter, not a politician. I'm no Superman. But of course, he had no control over what Hitler and Goebbels said about him to the world press, so like it or not, he became the great white hope. And when Joe Lewis got done with him, he was the great red and white splat. He spent a few days in the hospital after the fight. One more little tidbit. It took Schmeling 12 rounds to knock out Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis returned the favor in less than one round. I think that speaks for itself. Schmeling did recover and had a successful boxing career in Europe, but Nazi Germany didn't try to use him as their figurehead anymore. I have a feeling he was okay with that. 